understanding of what they have been working on, what these reports are about. So, Carson, it's not allowing me to share my PowerPoint. Oh, I think Brittany has to assign that to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There, we've got it. Awesome. So, like Carson said, my name is Samantha Kenny. I'm the Community Health Manager at United Way of Treasure Valley. And we do a couple of reports um, periodically to get a really comprehensive understanding of the health, education, and financial stability of our residents in our, in our region. Um, at United Way of Treasure Valley and United Ways across the world, really, our mission is to fight every day for the health, education, and financial stability of every member of our community. And so, um, we take great pride in understanding them with data and um, making decisions based on that data. So the two reports I'm going to talk to you today about are our ALICE report and our community assessment. The, both were updated June of 2020, and with that, I have to give a little bit of a disclaimer, the 2020 disclaimer about COVID. <laughs> All of this data was um, gathered and collected just right before COVID hit and the recent social justice movements happened. Um, but we do know that COVID is disproportionately impacting communities of color and older adults, low-income individuals and families that these reports highlight. Um, we also know around COVID that there's housing, food access, childcare, unemployment issues, and all of those things um, have been really highlighted through COVID. But I would say that these reports do reveal kind of some pre-existing conditions that um, were there to begin with and that COVID has really just magnified and exacerbated some of those underlying issues that we have in our community. Um, silver lining, if you can find one, is that with COVID, there's been an increased sense of urgency in addressing some of these issues and some of these concerns that we have. And um, we've added more individuals and organizations into our fight for all of our um, financial stability, education, and health of our citizens in an equitable way. So today I'm going to start by talking about ALICE. First of all, who is ALICE? ALICE is both a name and an acronym. Everyone seems to know an ALICE. It's my daughter's middle name and she's named after Grandma Alice. ALICE is a person um, and we really wanted to give a name to this population of um, asset limited, income constrained, employed individuals. So ALICE is also an acronym for, like I said, asset limited, income constrained and employed individuals. These are people that are hardworking. They work maybe a little too much. They make a little bit too much to qualify for a lot of assistance just above that federal poverty level, but not quite enough to really invest in themselves. Um, these are what the report calls maintainer jobs, but post COVID we realize are our essential workers. Um, they are the jobs that keep our systems going. There are nurses assistants, there are store clerks, um, they're around us all the time, and they make up about 40% of Idaho's population. Um, some of the new features with this report, if some of you are familiar with past reports, it used to come in a big PDF and you'd have to kind of thumb through it and find your county and information that way. Um, this year, we're really, really excited because it's an actual database on the internet. Brittany is um, out there, one of my colleagues from United Way. I hope she can put the link in the chat. But you can go directly to United Way website and um, get down to customizable data sets for your own purposes. It's a really, really interactive website and there's some new resource mapping and indicator tools on there where you can say, you're trying to figure out what resources are available for certain LS populations and certain census tracts. You can go in there and find, okay, let's say libraries. We know that they utilize libraries a lot for things. You can actually map that out in proportion to and in areas on a map where you can see how much um, LS population is around those resources. Also with the indicator tools, you can see things such as Wi-Fi, what percentage of Wi-Fi is um, population wise, so what percentage of the population can have access to Wi-Fi versus the population of Alice in those counties? So um, some really interested data points that you can get in, into great detail on for those data geeks there. 
but for our purposes today, and um, we're gonna just talk about Alice and poverty trends, go into some of those expanded budgets that I mentioned. Um, so first of all, poverty level is a federal one size fits all calculation. So it doesn't take into account the difference between Manhattan and Melba. It really is um, just a baseline level across the country. And when we look at Alice, we're also looking at regional impacts of things such as housing and cost of food um, based on regionality. And you can see over time that poverty levels after the Great Recession and Alice levels were both on the rise. And Alice has continued to rise even though poverty has begun to um, slow down pre-COVID, of course. Um, and some of us can logically assume that that poverty level it, and Alice rise is a result of people coming out of poverty, making maybe one or two dollars more than the federal poverty limit. But as you will see, as we go through more information on their community assessment, it's also a fall from people above the Alice thresholds coming down into Alice, whose wages have remained stagnant while cost of living has increased. So this is really, really apparent in our community assessment, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, take a deep breath. This is a lot of information, um, but this is an Alice household survival budget. This breaks down just how much you need to survive and make it um, above the federal poverty level and um, with families or as individuals. I know this is a ton of information, so I suggest you kind of choose a column that you most relate to. I'm gonna break down each of these line items a little bit on the methodology that was used in getting these figures. I'm not gonna go into great detail. There's actually a 15, 10 to 15 page document on the methodology on the website that you can go into if you're really, really wanting to understand how these um, figures were, cal were calculated. So for housing, um, we know again, this is, you're never gonna find housing at this rate in Ada County per se, but this is, the average across all of Idaho. Housing was based off of HUD's fair market rent, which is basically the 40th percentile of rental costs. Um, it doesn't account for inventory at that level, which we know there isn't a lot. So uh, that housing price is very subjective, but it's an average of what would minimally be needed for single adult and two adults, that's a one bedroom house. For two adults and two children, that, that's a two bedroom house. Um, and it includes rent, utilities, um, and any other kind of living expenses. Child care is a huge number, and this is based on state collected data for preschool. Uh, for children, school age children, it accounts for some after school care. For two adults and two children, that's an infant and a preschooler. Um, and that is, quite a lot of money and variable between counties as well. Food comes from the USDA's thrifty level budget. Uh, this is a budget that you're eating your leftovers with, you are meal planning, you're being really skimpy and self-aware on what you're doing with your food. This doesn't account for eating out or meals at fast food restaurants. Um, this is a very, very, Conservative food budget. Transportation is based on a minimum liability insurance plan with a clean driving record and good credit. So that's very minimum. It's also based on a small sedan for two adults or a single adult and a medium sedan for a family. And it includes gas, oil, and vehicle maintenance. What it does not include is a car payment. So this is assuming your car is paid for and it's running well, and you have good credit, and you don't get tickets. So uh, that's also a pretty conservative estimate. Healthcare is one of the harder calculations, um, but it basically is an average from the Affordable Care Act and the exchanges. It also includes prescription costs, deductibles, and co-pays, and so this is assuming that you're pretty healthy. This isn't um, 
you're planning for a surgery or anything like that, having to meet your deductible, this is really, really minimal healthcare costs. Technology, I think this is probably easiest to start out with what it doesn't include. This doesn't include Wi-Fi. This is basically a data plan for a phone. We know that that's an inexpensive way for some people to access the internet is through data plans. This is based on Consumer Reports' cheapest data plan available on the market. Again, for a single adult, it's one phone for two adults, and for families, it's just two phones. And this doesn't include the cost of phone, install, phone payment installation payments within your monthly billing. So you're, you have a phone that's a smartphone, it's already paid for, and this is just the minimum amount, the minimum cost. That leaves a lot of things in miscellaneous bucket. Um, if you need Wi-Fi, you may be paying out of your miscellaneous budget. If you need shoes, if you need to pay for pet food, if you need to update a wardrobe for a job interview, that's coming out of your miscellaneous budget. So it's pretty conservative budget. Again, these individuals and households are employed, so they're paying back into the system through taxes. Taxes are variable upon county and um, city. So this is again, just the Idaho average, which brings us to our monthly totals and our annual totals, and then the annual wage based on the annual needed budget amount. So you can see that it takes quite a bit just to survive in Idaho. We know that looks different for Ada County. This is an actual snapshot from our website. So you can see down below there's additional household sizes that you can add to your annual total to customize that budget for a household that looks like you. Um, but again, significantly increase in housing costs in Ada County. Child care costs are also increased and food is increased. One of the things we learned in our Alice report is that the survival budget for food in Ada County has increased 46% since 2013. So we know that the food cost is on the rise and it's something that we don't necessarily factor in uh, when we're considering poverty levels and, and assistance. Transportation remains the same, healthcare remains the same, technology remains the same, miscellaneous, it might cost a little bit more to go get your pair of shoes um, in Ada County and taxes are quite a bit higher than the Idaho average in Ada County. Comparing that to Canyon County, because we're neighbors and we see a lot of people going back and forth, um, we know that it's a little less to, to live in Canyon County and survive, and Alice data proves that out. But it's not much of a difference, and um, we see families struggling in both of these regions. So what would it take to actually become stable and invest in yourself. Um, this stability budget is really, really fascinating and it's pretty consistent across all of the different counties that you have to make twice the amount of the survival budget to get to a place where you can start squirreling away some money for a rainy day, for a pandemic or for whatever is happening in, um, in your life, a vehicle that breaks down, uh, all of those things, where are you gonna get the money to be stable and to weather those, those disruptions in your life? You have to make a substantial amount more, nearly $100,000 for a family of four with school-age kids um, in Canyon County. I looked up the median income in Canyon County today and it is $43,000. So we know that there is quite a large percentage of people struggling in our region, in fact, the Alice population uh, for the five county region that we look at in our community assessment, all of them are above the state average for Alice and federal poverty level, except for Ada County, um, which you'll see in our assessment that there's a lot of people that are moving further and further out to live and survive and working in Ada County. On that note, I will transition to our community assessment, which again focuses on those four, those five counties in the Southwest region of Idaho, which make up 43% of our state population. So we know that we're getting pretty accurate picture of the struggles of our state population in, in this large group. Our assessment was 
a collaborative process with St. Alphonsus Health System. Um, it is quite thorough. It's about 140 pages. There's a lot of information in it. We have it structured within our pillars of financial stability, health, and education. So each of those receives a good amount of assessment um, under those topic areas and in those sectors. There's a lot of community voice in this. We surveyed 23,000 surveys went out to people across all of these different um, counties and we received a lot of input from them. We also conducted a number of uh, focus groups where we heard a lot of issues firsthand from individuals. Um, we tried to diversify those focus groups to include refugees, LGBTQIA plus um, individuals and really get a good understanding of a lot of different demographics within our region and, and learn from them what they're really experiencing firsthand. We did this concurrently with St. Alphonsus doing a Western Treasure Valley assessment that included Ontario and some of our northern counties of Payette and Washington County. And they were they used the same methodology that we did, um, which helps us understand that relationship between those border towns. A little bit about our social influencers of health framework. So social influencers of health is the same as the social de determinants of health. Many of us are familiar with that. We know that these are the conditions in which people are born and grow and live and work and age. And these circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources. And many people don't have a lot of control over these things, but they have the greatest impact on health outcomes. And I would argue they have the greatest impact on educational outcomes and even our criminal justice outcomes and our financial stability outcomes. Um, these are the things that influence success and well-being for individuals in our community. And we looked at our data through this lens. And our aim with that is to achieve health equity and ultimately justice. Um, this, this graphic, I think a lot of people are familiar with, I think the added justice is appropriate in these times and it's really important to remember that our goal is to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity and a fair opportunity to be healthy. The ultimate goal being justice, which is created, is created by designing spaces and systems that make access to health easy and accessible regardless of age, race, ethnicity, gender, ability, etc. So just know that this was the lens in which we viewed our data. Um, we worked closely with a large group of advisory advisors and an advisory committee, about 30 different advisors, who looked through the data after we collected it at the end of December, early January, and they helped us form our priorities, our top six priority areas based on the data that we received. Um, they're prioritized by rank order. The number one issue that we're seeing from residents and through the data is affordable safe housing and homelessness is a huge, huge issue. Being able to afford safe housing, rent eats first, as you can see in our Alice information that we just went through, um, it has a significant impact on that survival budget. Wages and job ability was number two. That was a very, very common theme in all of our findings. Um, we know that wages are not keeping pace with the cost of living. There are jobs available, but they're not jobs that allow for upward mobility or for quality wages and wage growth. And that was heard over and over again. Um, cost of living again, including housing, but also transportation and childcare costs are a significant burden. We can see that with our Alice information as well. Mental health and well-being and substance use came in as um, a difficult area for citizens, an area of high concern. Being able to access providers, we know we have shortage areas for mental health and well mental health and behavioral health providers. 
Um, also access to affordable health care, including behavioral health and dental. Uh, affordability, there's a lot of people that are insured, but the affordability comes in with increased costs for co-pays and deductibles. Um, they're insured, but they're not, uh, they're under insured really is what the situation is there. They can't afford the services even with the insurance. Um, education, including quality early childhood education is an also an area of concern, especially when considering some of our educational outcomes and markers. So here's what we know. Idaho's population has increased quite a bit in the last decade, and it only continues to increase. We know that in, um, from July 2017 to July 18, Idaho tied Nevada for the highest population growth in the nation at 2.1%. And that Boise City has experienced housing, the highest rates of housing cost increases for years on end, over and over, but wages have not kept up. So this is something we hear, heard quite a bit. But on the brighter side, our commu community members love our communities. We, believe it's a really nice place to raise families, it's tight-knit, it's safe, it feels good. Um, it's, you know that your neighbor, this is a quote from one of our focus group participants, you know that your neighbor would get the shirt off their back if they had to. And that feels really, really good to a lot of people. So despite all of our difficulties with wages and growth, there's a lot of good that has come to our community with our connectedness. Um, so in our financial stability section, we're seeing that wages are really not keeping up. They're not keeping up with the states around us. Um, I know personally I have a college student that makes $15 an hour in Washington State and doesn't want to move back because there's no way to um, afford living when the cost of living has increased so much in Boise. So we are seeing that on our border a lot of people working in oregon making more and living in idaho the hispanic population in idaho isn't as educated and isn't able to access a lot of those higher wage jobs so we know that they're disproportionately impacted by some of this wage disparity and then the cost of living of course is outpacing the wage growth and public support. So the public support is still based on the federal poverty level, um, which is very, very low and based on minimum wage standards. So a lot of people can't access the resources that they need to further their ability to progress financially. Housing stability, again, this just de details exactly how hard it is to access affordable housing. We have a rental vacancy of 1.5% in the Boise metro area. A healthy rental market has at least 4% vacancy. And we know that rental prices have gone up 23% in the past three years. Housing, 20% in one year. Um, those that are renting are finding it harder and harder to squirrel away money to actually invest in a home and to invest in a home in the, their own neighborhood. So many of them are moving outward to Owyhee, Washington, Payette County, even outside of Canyon County to find cost of living um, and housing that's affordable. This has affected our transportation. We are a very car centric valley. Everyone takes single solo car commuters. Um, and we've seen that that has increased the amount of commute times um, and people working further, living further away from their work. Less than 1% of our population uses public transportation to get to work. We heard time and time again from our focus group participants that availability of bus routes is limiting for people who work swing shifts and night shifts and often the bus routes don't go by the neighborhood that they live to the place that they work. So it's often very hard to access public transportation. Although in our surveys, 45% of those surveyed said that public transportation was a big concern for them. So we know that there is becoming a more of an awareness around public transportation and a need for it. Idaho is one of only two states 
with no state funding for public transportation. And until we do something about that, we're going to be sitting in our cars for longer and longer. $3,000 to maintain a car per year, that's a significant amount and it shows in our Alice budget as well. The food survival budget, like I mentioned, increased 46% since 2013. We know that there's a lot of residents in Idaho that are food insecure and disproportionately it's affecting families with children and that many of those families don't qualify for assistance. That means they have an asset of some kind like a car um, and they just can't qualify for assistance they need. We know that the cost of having a car um, is expensive and so it definitely eats into that food budget. So there's a lot of food insecurity within our Treasure Valley that was only been exasperated by the COVID crisis as we see lines and lines of cards coming to pick up food, free food. Um, I know with our days of caring, I got to go and deliver food with my daughter at one of our, the elementary school pickup sites. Um, we did free lunches for about 120 individuals and I felt really, really good, but I was also really surprised at the number of people coming and accessing those opportunities. Our health section, some of the highlights from our health section. 96% of Idaho is, is designated as having a primary health care physician service area. So they're not, they're not enough providers. Um, in the report, I think it, there's some amazing graphics and detail in nearly every one of our counties and in nearly every one of our health um, sectors, including dental and behavioral health, we have drastically low numbers of providers. So accessing care is difficult. Um, there's a lot of providers that aren't accepting new patients, especially if they're not the patients that fit their, um, their demographic, LGBTQIA, Patients reported having a lot of difficulty finding appropriate care and being denied care. Also Medicaid, a lot of providers aren't accepting new Medicaid patients and um, the patients can't access care because there's not enough providers in their area. And a lot of times their time of service and the hours that they're open don't work with their work schedule. And we know that work is probably one of the most important things for families that are struggling. Um, the cost has increased significantly for co-pays and deductibles. Non-white Idahoans have a significantly less access to care because most of our Hispanic population is in some of those rural counties. Um, it's a real issue having that kind of access to care. So that was one of the themes that came out in our health sector. Um, we also know that we have a behavioral health crisis on our hands. We are one of the highest suicide rates in the nation, two times the national average, and students are reporting in their behavioral risk assessment that they're considering, 22% of them are considering suicide. That's quite a bit and quite staggering. Um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with ACEs, but Adverse Childhood Experiences, one fifth of Idaho children aged zero to 17 have experienced one or more ACE, ACEs. Um, and we know that that has implications on lifelong health outcomes, including diabetes and heart disease. So that's concerning for us. Death by opioid use is increasing, especially in our rural counties, which is quite scary. Their, um, Hawaii County had some of the highest rates which I found quite interesting. Um, more than one in five high school students have vaped in the past 30 days. We know that the vaping epidemic is real. We also know that that's disproportionately um, affecting kids in the COVID crisis. Kids that vape are far more likely to have complications with COVID. Um, so this is really, really important data. Um, and there's a whole ton more in our appendix within this document. So if you are in the health industry, I would suggest looking at some of these indicators and data points. It's full. This is definitely a very complete document when it comes to the health um, healthcare sector. Education, our last 
area to highlight. Idaho is one of four states with no funded preschool. And we know that education begins at birth. Kids start learning as soon as they are um, alive and out of the womb. So that's a big concern that we don't have any state funded daycare. 50% of Idaho is also considered a childcare desert, meaning families are having to travel far distances just to even access childcare, often paying more in transportation and in actual childcare costs because there is, there's waiting lists all over our state and um, that's only being exacerbated by the COVID crisis. Many childcare centers are having to close and not making it through. So this, I can imagine, will only become more of an issue to address or an opportunity, as we could possibly say. Um, the childcare costs, as we saw in the Alice budgets, are astronomical for anyone with young kids. I feel for anyone who has a preschooler and an infant after seeing those numbers. Uh, Idaho loses a lot of money for employees due to childcare access issues. In fact, that was actually one of a, co a common theme among some of our focus group recipients was that employees struggle to find childcare and they call in and miss days of work because they can't access it. Less than half of the Treasure Valley's beginning kindergartners are scoring above or at grade level. This kind of implies that we don't have great access to quality early education as well. Um, we would hope that our child care centers and our preschools are of quality in getting those kids ready for kindergarten, um, but our data shows that they're not. Um, overall, in education, our assessment scores are remaining relatively consistent. Students are making significant growth during the year, but we have summer slide issues. And with COVID, we're going to have some COVID slide issues. Um, and we know that a lot of students are not getting the same quality of education as they could or would be getting um, in times other than COVID, and for good reason. Um, graduation rates are holding, but we are not spending any more on our students and only about 45% of our students are going on after high school to college. One of the saddest quotes that came out of the report, and I don't want to leave on a total sad note, but uh, the per pupil cost is really, really impacting our ability to get quality teachers. We actually had a teacher say, why would I teach kids for $9 an hour when I can make $15 an hour checking packages at Amazon? Um, that's one of our early child's teachers so we know how important that early childhood education is and how important education is for the success and health and financial stability um, of our population but we're not investing in it so some opportunity there and that's kind of the note I want to leave us on is that there is a lot of information not all of it is good but we have some solutions and we have people at the table that are willing to make changes um, we looked in all of these different sectors that we looked at, we looked at policy systems and environmental change opportunities that we could have. And so if you go through the report, look at these, see where you can act and um, take action toward improving some of the situations that we're finding ourselves in. Um, some of them are simple co-location, some of them is just aligning better with other partners. So. Take that into consideration. Know that we are in it together and united, we will be much stronger than we are in silos. And with that, you can send questions to me or I can answer any questions that you have and hopefully, yep, timing isn't too bad. I know there's comments. That was great, Samantha. Thank you so much for that presentation. And it was, wow, that was, I just learned learned a lot. Um, and it does paint a fairly bleak picture, at least at the moment. Um, so I have a few questions to start. And if, if other folks want to want to um, add some more in the chat as as we're as we're chatting, feel free. Um, so I'm curious, 
how often are these Alice reports uh, completed? Because I, I see on the site that there's, there's past every three years or so, it seems like there's a community assessment. Um, the community assessment is every three years and the Alice assessment is every two years. With the new uh, Alice database online, I think the goal of, for that is that it will be updated uh, periodically with new information more regularly than in past reports. So that's exciting. Um, but the community assessment is done every three years with our partners across the valley. And when, do, how, like, how far do those go back? Do you know? Our first assessment we did in 2011. Okay. Um, you can access the 2017 report online as well as the 2020 report online. There are quite a bit of consistencies between them, but some of the priority areas have changed over the years. With housing costs increasing so much, it's definitely come to the forefront versus the last report. Um, but some things that are consistent are the access to health care that has remained very, very consistent across our region for the last decade. Um, issues around the, and concerns around mental and behavioral health has definitely remained consistent. Yeah, yeah. And I, another thing I'm curious, so with this community we have with the HCRI and, and folks who have joined today, what are your hopes for how we can best kind of engage with this data or, or what are your kind of hopes for these reports and how they'll be used going forward? I think um, that it's very, it's good information to educate yourselves on the actual impacts when you're talking about resilience through the frameworks that Brittany has presented with this group, uh, you are looking at their financial resilience, especially in like this pandemic and how it has affected us. Um, and we know with natural disasters, there can be similar impacts with financial issues as well. Um, I know that was part of the statement in previous meetings with partners that they were really interested in, in how to build kind of that financial resilience in. And when indexing resilience across a community, I think that taking that into account is very, very viable, as well as as healthcare, when you're considering pandemics, we need to understand the disparities that we have. So we understand where we need to kind of build in systems to build that resilience for populations that wouldn't, that aren't already having those um, issues you know, the equity lens, I guess, is what I would say. We really need to think about what different resources we need to, to create and systems we need to create to get those resources to the people that have the most disparities, which we're seeing with, say, our meatpacking plants and our um, farm workers that are at, at disproportionately being affected by COVID. What were some of the systems that could be put into place? Uh, those kinds of things. I think that's the idea of this this data is to use it for finding opportunity and solutions um, and really investigating where those uh, weak parts are to build a healthier and more resilient community. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, it looks like we have some questions coming in. So um, one is from Francisco Salinas and he says, um, is this data strategically informing any of our legislators? And maybe how? We have plans, I mean, we've shared Alice information with them in the past. Um, we have plans to continue to share Alice information and uh, our local legislators, we hope to meet with about our community assessment. We have in the past as well. Um, and our local, our local policymakers in Ada County and Camden County, I think could really use some of this. I would love to present it to the health district boards. Um, I think anyone and everyone should kind of look at this, but I don't know how formally it's been done in the past. I think there's been a few that have been real champions. Uh, Diane, Diana Lachando is on our board, so I know she's very familiar with these things. Um, I think it's kind of a case-by-case -case scenario when you talk about legislators and what they're really interested in. I would hope that this would pique some people's interest, um, but carrying that message from multiple partners, like everyone here that's listening, was also very valuable, taking that to your legislators. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, let's see, I think Brittany had a follow-up um, to that. So just, 
let's see, are cities and counties using this data, do you know, um, and how are these issues being tackled at the city versus a county level, or are they even doing that? And, do, and maybe do you know anything about that? Well, like I said, um, Diana Lachiando is very familiar with this. I'm sure it influences her decision making and her um, personally. I know regionally that the Western Idaho Community Health Collaborative that is a unique collaborative between Southwest District Health and Central District Health is actually using ALICE data as um, their target population. So they're utilizing that for their target population in how they're um, planning to implement some of their solutions to the social determinants of health. So that's how I know it's been using, been utilized here. I know other groups have used the assessment to, to help them with grant writing and um, we require mm -hmm. all those that are applying for grants at United Way of Treasure Valley to utilize the, the community assessment um, and do their programming accordingly. So they have to identify parts of the assessment that they're actually working on um, within their grant application. So I know that's how we've been using it. And those are some areas. I'm sure there's other areas that other people use it. And I, Trish Nielsen's on this call. I don't know how Canyon County uses it. If she does some, she, I know she's very familiar with it as well. It looks like she has her hand raised, so yeah. go ahead, Patricia, if you, if you yeah, want Thanks, to. Sam. Uh, thanks, Carson. Yeah, and Kate Dahl is on the call, too. She is kind of our, our project manager on the update to our comprehensive plan. And we had just ended our um, initial round of public involvement in early March, and then everything happened. So we're, you know, Kate has a draft, but we re realized we need to understand better what, we do, what we're Kind of how things have changed. What well, and this, uh, so we have looked at the Alice report to help us focus on that human side of data, and not just put tables in the comp plan. But what does this really mean? What are the stress points in our community right now that have, and as Sam said, have been really exacerbated by COVID? That were there, but now are even worse. So, um, so we'll be using it. We're not going to like copy it, but it's 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 that all I can say is that human element to the data that I think the Alice report is really valuable for. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I was curious too, um, with the surveys and like the focus groups, how did you, I'd, I'd love to hear more about kind of the process of actually gathering all of this information, both the qualitative and the sort of quantitative side of things. Um, the quantitative data we gathered through a number of databases um, that are commonly used county health rankings. Um, we utilize Trinity Health System with their database. And, you know, we're using Burfus and all of the typical like government mm -hmm. data sources to bolster some of that hard data. The qualitative data was with a lot of help and assistance from our steering and advisory committee. Um, we were able to and if in the assessment, in the appendix, you'll see actual samples of the survey that went out. You'll see the actual um, results from that survey, from every survey that went out. Um, you'll see the template for questions for focus groups and for key informant interviews. Key informant interviews, we had about 30 different participants. So these are people that are doing the first-hand delivery of programs to populations in need. And we, I mean, it's a wide variety from Jesse Tree to the Regional Health Districts to the Oral Health Alliance, Boise School District, Ketch, all, a number of different cities across the Treasure Valley. And, and um, also with our focus groups, we focused on populations that are receiving those services. So they kind of went hand in hand a bit. Um, we did focus group at the International Rescue Committee. We did focus groups at health, um, health collaboratives in Owyhee and Elmore County and in Gem County. We worked with Head Start families, LBGQTIA. Um, so yeah, a variety of those. And we 
held about the, each of those focus groups were about an hour, an hour and a half. And it was a free flowing conversation. We took lots of notes and recordings and um, we worked with our contractor to kind of curate that information and add it to it. And the nice thing about this assessment, throughout the assessment on the side marks, you'll actually get quotations from people in those focus groups that kind of tell the story of the data that's in the, in the assessment. So it's worth the read, um, especially if you want to get to know what residents are actually feeling and seeing. Yeah, that's great. I think it's, it's nice to have the pairing of both the, the quantitative and qualitative to really paint the, the human picture, like Patricia was saying. Um, okay, we have another question from Greg. So, um, so he says, the data suggests that the conditions you describe are only growing the urban-rural divide in Idaho. Would you agree with that? And, and that trend is continuing. I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, that trend is, um, and as we look more into those rural, rural counties, it is staggering the difference uh, in their ability to access all kinds of different services, food, help, um, education. And so we know that the resources really are strapped in those rural counties. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'd be curious to know more about, um, so given those priorities and the ranking that you guys have, what are some of the things that at the United Way you guys are kind of focused on related to affordable housing or some sort of boots on the ground things that you guys are working on? Well, at United Way, we, um, we have two arms that we kind of work within our community impact. We have the actual community impact work that we do, and we focus a lot around community schools and social determinants of health. So our community school model is really working on kind of co-location, um, bringing resources to those neighborhoods and those areas that are resource kind of poor, um, and, and co-locating them in a building in a school that's utilized frequently. Um, with our social determinants of health work, we're working closely with collaboratives across the region to address their own unique health um, issues and opportunities. So um, we're really working toward addressing things at a policy systems and environmental level. Um, I would say that's one arm. The other arm is that we partner with a number of different other agencies and we fund a number of different programs through United Way. Um, and we do that again with the lens of our community assessment and addressing the actual needs in the community. So we implement that by having those partners apply for funding with the community assessment in mind and um, kind of go forth that way, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, let's see, there's another question. So is city or county developed low income housing available to the Alice community or is it restricted to those living at the poverty level? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question to, to see what resources are available for the Alice community. I think, um, I think that's city by city. I know that Boise City has a number of different programs for kind of graduated programs for different income levels and finding housing. Um, and I, I know there are programs out there for kind of that middle, the working poor and those that make a little too much for federal assistance, but um, not enough. And so there's cities and other agencies that are kind of filling those gaps. Yeah. Um, Patricia, did you, you had a comment about the urban rural divide. Did you want to speak up for a moment about that? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I just was thinking about Greg's question and I guess historically in Idaho, it's, I viewed it as the haves and the have nots in terms of the urban and rural. And now with the urban areas under, you know, um, pretty bad stress in terms of housing costs that maybe that's an opportunity to, to get some coalitions or partnerships to work on these issues. So maybe it's actually closed the divide, not in a way we really want to, like having a, you know, it's, we, we just assume everybody have more economic gain, but um, anyway, it's just a thought I just wanted to just throw out there. I guess I'd, I, it makes me curious to look at the data and, and look at that a little more closely. Yeah. So. Definitely. Thank you. Well, it looks like, let's see, Brent, do you want to speak up? He said some thoughts about low-income housing. Yeah, I can tell you that uh, the 
in Caldwell, the CDBG is uh, one of our mechanisms for attempting to help with low-income housing. The other thing that we've been able to what do is, is with sorry, the what does CDBG stand for? Oh, sure good question. Sorry, uh, community <laughs> development block grant program. So, a city over fifty thousand is quote entitled to um, under federal rules to uh, some quantity, which actually is is usually based on um, socioeconomic, especially financial uh, status of your community cross section. So that helps us with that housing element. We also um, participate with the HUD grants. They rely on having some public participation. And so we usually do things that are legal for a city to do, like helping with the sidewalk improvements and other things like that. We often help with those kind of things on grants. So those are the mechanisms we really have available. There's, there's just, there's no financial way for the city to participate, like by promoting an actual housing project. We just, that's, and property taxes are already tricky and, um, an important note for this group is that this there is a tax shift occurring with property taxes in this environment where, you know, for Tricia or for me, for our entities, you know, the maximum tax growth is 3%. So, you know, that's in this market less than inflation, but it's, but what's happening is you got this huge growth in residential value and property taxes are as simple as assessed value multiplied by the levy rate. Um, but as that value base grows and a bigger proportion of it becomes residential, it shifts the tax burden onto residential because it's all unitized. It's, it's, you know, a quantity of each value dollar. And so uh, there's a, a serious tax shift happening and that's creating a way more significant property tax burden on um, individuals and residents as compared to non-residential. Thanks, Brent, for sharing that. Um, Samantha, let's, we have about four minutes left. Is there anything you want to sort of finish with or any, any final thoughts? And then I will also post, um, just show the, share the uh, flyer for next month if anyone's interested. We haven't set up a Zoom call yet for it, um, but we will shortly. So Sam, do you have any final calls I to action? Just, <laughs> calls to action? Yeah, share the report. Um, Go on and investigate the reports, both of them, and share them with people that you work with. Consider them when you're making decisions programmatically, um, because we all have something to give toward this, um, to our collective community, especially right now. And that's all I would suggest. Thank you so much, Sam. And and that was just such a great presentation. And and. You know, it gives us a starting point, you know, as long as we can understand where we're at currently and also maybe better understand what, what these COVID impacts are going to be, then we can think about, you know, how do we move forward and, and make some changes. So, um, all right. Well, thank you so much, everyone who joined us today. So this is our next month um, speaker. And you'll notice we don't have a Zoom link set up quite yet, but we will be, um, we will be putting that on our website shortly. So, so stay tuned for that. And... Um, yeah, thank you all so much for coming and we look forward to seeing you next month. So thank you. All right. I might go ahead and just end the call. Did you get the chat and everything? And then we can, we can jump on another call separately. Yeah, sure. Um, do you okay. want to send me a link or should I send a link? Sure, yeah, I can. I'll go ahead and send it. Okay, sounds good. I'm gonna make a, take a three minute break and then I'll see you okay. in a minute. Sounds good. All right, All right. great job, thanks.